Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm David Caldwell, the president of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, and it's a great uh, pleasure and privilege to be here tonight. Where would we antiquaries be if it hadn't been for the National Library? And I'm sure many of you, like me, will have spent many happy and productive hours in this place. And we're particularly grateful to our colleagues in the library for facilitating this talk and uh, partnering our endeavours. We are aware as antiquaries that uh, some of our interests are not just limited to archaeology uh, and history, but uh, an interest in books and collecting books and manuscripts is very much something that a number of us are interested in. But I hope all of you will very much uh, enjoy um, this talk this evening. We've already had some happy co collaboration with the library. Um, some of us were privileged to be shown around the, uh, the, the, the splendid plague exhibition the other week uh, by the responsible curator, uh, Dr. Annette Hagen. And I would certainly recommend all of you to go and have a good look at it. Um, give you some wonderful ideas about um, wintry weather in Scotland, I'm sure. <laughs> Before I introduce tonight's speaker, uh, let me just say the, the apparent obvious. Uh, the talk tonight is being filmed, uh, just in case any of you weren't aware of that. And I might add that that is very much a courtesy um, of our sponsor, um, who um, has, has, has done this, helped us do this, uh, Sir Angus Grossard. I'm very grateful to him for his support. The talk tonight has been given by uh, Dr. Ralph McLean, who is the, the manuscript curator here for the long 18th century. And I trust he'll, he'll explain what uh, long means in that context. And his subject is the literary forgeries of antique Smith. Ralph tells me that uh, most of the forgeries he's talking about actually come from a gift which our society made to the library a bit number of years ago. <laughs> so it will uh, be very, very good indeed to hear a bit more about what we've seen. So, Well, thank you very much, David, for that lovely introduction. Um, just before we start, a um, couple of housekeeping matters to attend to. Um, the first thing to say is that there is no fire drill scheduled for this evening. So should the fire alarm sound, uh, please leave by either door that you entered, heading on to George the Fourth Bridge, uh, or by the fire exit to the right of the stage. Um, we just have to hope that if there is a fire, it starts over there and not over there. Uh, in any event, the library staff will be there to, to help and assist. Um, can I also ask people if you have any mobile phones on, if you could switch them off, put them on silent, please. Um, that would be great. Um, okay, so the long 18th century, just before I start, um, is actually everything from about 1688 up to about 1832. I think the reason for that is so they can give me all the Walter Scott papers, uh, as, as well as uh, my 18th century duties as well. Um, before I start, I'd like to just uh, have a shout out to... Um, to Kenny and to Ollie, uh, the events people for putting on, helping to put on tonight's event, and also to um, Kira McDermott and to Gordon Yeoman who helped with the with the display um, that you, that's on and available for us tonight. Okay, without further ado, then the forgeries of Antique Smith. Now, the act of forgery has been practiced from almost every moment that the written documentation has been produced, as Edmund Chambers has noted. As soon as man set foot on the slopes of Parnassus the shadow of the forger fell on the path behind him. From the audacious and sophisticated attempts to fool vast swathes of the population through such works, such spurious works as the Hitler Diaries, to the schoolchild attempt to, con to convince their gym, gym teacher that they are really sick and providing a note written from their parents, forgery exists at all levels of the literary spectrum. This is understandably something of an issue for someone who, works, who looks after manuscripts at the National Library of Scotland, where they are fundamental to our work. Among those willing to poison the waters of literary production, Alexander Howland Smith, better known as Antique Smith, is a special case. Indeed, as the curator of both Robert Burns and Walter Scott manuscripts, the name of Antique Smith sends something of a shiver down the spine, as both of these figures were particular favourites for Smith to forge. Although, as we shall discover, a great many authorities stepped forward to pronounce on the spurious nature of the documents, and frequently suggested 
that the quality of the forgeries was so poor that they could only fool the most credulous of people. Nevertheless, he managed to flood the manuscripts market with such numbers of forgeries that even to this day it's difficult to estimate how many manuscripts he forged in total and how many of them are potentially lurking in collections today across the world. Part of Smith's achievement, if we can call it that, is the sheer scale of his forgery, not only in terms of the numbers of documents, but also in terms of whom he was forging. In addition to Burns and Scott, Smith tried his hand at, and deep breath, Mary Queen of Scots, Oliver Cromwell, Thomas Carlyle, William Thackeray, Charles Dickens, William Pitt, Robert Southey, Maria Edgeworth, David Hume, Daniel Defoe, Edmund Burke, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Lord Byron, Percy Shelley, the Earl of Mar, Bonnie Prince Charlie, Bonnie Dundee, or Bloody Clavers, given your politics, James Hogg, Alan Ramsay, James VIII, or the Old Pretender, and James VI. Um, now, before I go on, uh, just to give a, a, a flavour, I'll mainly be focusing on Robert Burns, but just to give a flavour of some of the other uh, people that he's forged. This is a forgery of Oliver Cromwell, all of them by Antique Smith. Um, this one, a forgery by Daniel Defoe. <laughs> I, I should say, um, all of the papers in the Society of Antiquaries are actually marked spurious. So um, it's quite easy to tell if something's fake if it's stamped spurious. <laughs> uh, but here we go, here's Daniel Defoe. Here's one for Percy Shelley. Lord Byron. Only one spurious in that one. Uh, Thomas Carlyle. And Bonnie Prince Charlie. Um, just as a, from, from looking at this, just a kind of quick audience participation thing here. Um, if you think one of these is genuine, one is fake. Um, if you think the one on the left is genuine, as you raise your hand. A few hands. If you think the one on the right is genuine, could you raise your hand? Mm, still <laughs> and quite a few people sitting on the fence. Um, well, in actual fact, it's the right-hand signature, which is the genuine one. The left hand is, is actually the fake. Um, as you can see, though, it's like the, the, the similarities of the hand. Um, so clearly he has seen documents and he has had access to them in order to, to be able to, to forge them. Now, the Edinburgh Evening Dispatch, the newspaper which did more than most to bring Smith to, rightly to justice, asked how such a blizzard of manuscripts by such famous names could appear in the market all at once, without those in the profession doing any background checks on them. In preparing for this talk, um, a phrase which kept reappearing in my head was, some men have plenty of money and no brains, and some men have plenty of brains and no money. Surely men with plenty of money and no brains were made for men with plenty of brains and no money. <laughs> Now, clearly, Smith had the brains to produce, ma produce mass numbers of manuscripts who were able to fill substantial numbers of collectors. Such a number that he was actually able to make a living from this between 1885 and 1892, when he was finally arrested, put on trial, and jailed for profiting from forged documents. Now, in the course of this talk, I'll investigate the story of Antique Smith and his literary forgeries. The Society of Antiquities of Scotland possesses one of the largest collections of Smith's forgeries. Um, or it's currently on deposit here at the library. Uh, this is the um, document, or this is the, the manuscript, MS2209, where most of the uh, newspaper articles and cuttings are kept and obviously freely available for people to come in and to have a look at at the library. Now, from these papers, we will chart the emergence of the forgeries in the public consciousness uh, and the ensuing tale of how Smith was finally brought to justice. Along the way, with the help of the collection, I will provide examples of Smith's manuscripts and pause to consider the techniques that he used in order to convince the public that what they had bought was the genuine article. Now, why was Antique Smith able to operate for so long before he was finally identified and stopped? Now, part of the reason for this may be down to human nature. How many people would actually admit to have been taken in? When people have bought what they consider a literary treasure, at often a considerable sum, it would surely be very hard indeed to, fall, to come forward and then to admit that what you effectively bought was a useless piece of paper. The mania for collecting autographs of poets and authors was and is a craze shared by many people who wish to have a memento in the hand of a literary hero. 
Contemporaries at the trial of Antique Smith likened it to the Middle Age veneration of pious multitudes who desired to possess the relics of the saints. And just like in that scenario, there were a plethora of vendors willing to pro provide these genuine originals. Now, the key moment in the exposure of these hordes of forgeries that had infested Scotland came innocuously enough in Ayrshire in the local publication, the Cumnock Express. On the 12th of August, 1892, they published a letter from the collection of James Mackenzie, which purported to be a previously unpublished exchange between Robert Burns and a Mr. John Hill, who was a weaver at Cumnock. And here's the printed version of that paper, uh, as it appeared. Uh, this is not in the, the Cumnock Express, but actually in the Edinburgh Evening Dispatch, which went round and, and collated the, the, um, the exchange in, in the Express. Now, the year that Burns wrote this letter was missing, but Mocklin had been added to uh, the top of the letter, which the Express indicated could have been written about the time of the poet's marriage. The interest in this letter was great because, if genuine, it would have introduced a new figure into the world of Burns' correspondence. However, among the local community, suspicion was also great on the grounds that no one had ever heard of a John Hill weaver, nor was there any evidence of his ever having actually been in the locality. For someone who had supposedly been a crony of Burns, there was not a trace of him. Within the week, letters were sent to the Express to record doubts over the piece, alluding to a potentially wider problem of the forgeries. One anonymous writer remarked, many such manuscripts have recently been foisted on that badly burnt bairn, the Burns collector, who from prudential reasons has resolved to be wise hereafter and to look the gift horse closely in the mouth. Scepticism was also rife among Burns scholars and collectors. H.D. Colville Scott, one of the most well-known of the day, challenged the authenticity of the piece and demanded that the John Hill letter be sent to the British Museum to ascertain its true status, or, should that prove impractical, to send it to the Advocates Library, which, given its location, was only a stone's throw away from Mackenzie's address in Forest Road. So confident was Colville Scott belief in the spuriousness of the letter that he offered to pay a guinea to the Kilmarnock Federation of Burns Clubs should the manuscript actually prove to be genuine. When Mackenzie refused to have it verified, Colville Scott returned it with an improved offer of five pounds, which was likewise ignored. Colville Scott explicitly stated the scale of the problem in Scotland, noting that the number of Burns and Scott forgeries in the country was considerable and that young and inexperienced collectors were more susceptible to being fooled by them. Clearly stung by the suggestion that his manuscripts were fakes, Mackenzie responded on the 26th of August by saying, the letter is a genuine product of the poet, attested fully by those who are thoroughly competent to judge, including a respected descendant of the author. Robert Burns Begg, who was believed to be that respected <coughs> descendant, later wrote to the dispatch to say that his name had been dragged through the affair as a party to the manuscripts. He insisted that he did not authenticate any of the letters and that his name should not have appeared in association with them. Begg conceded that he did in fact know Mackenzie and had discussed Burns with him on occasion, but that he didn't know enough about the handwriting to offer any definitive opinion. In order to attest to the genuineness of the letter, Mackenzie stated that the item had been in his collection for 25 years. In a statement which threw up more questions than it provided answers, he wrote that the manuscripts had been submitted to the most experienced critic known to exist, who was prepared, if need be, to give his oath that Robert Burns wrote his letter. At the bottom of the letter, to underline his credentials, and don't shoot the messenger here, Mackenzie added, FSA Scott. <laughs> now, who was this most experienced critic? Step forward, the veteran Edinburgh bookseller, James Stilley. Stilley had operated his business for decades in the city and made much of the fact that in his youth he knew Walter Scott when he was a lawyer's clerk. Indeed, often when professing on the genuine nature of, of Scott's letters, Stilley would remind people of his acquaintance and the fact that he had seen Scott writing. The Express noted that Stilley was one of the oldest and the most highly respected booksellers in Edinburgh and for many years had been a collector of Burns's manuscripts estimating that more had passed through his hands than through those of any other man. In a letter to the Express, Stilley vouched for Mackenzie as a high-class amateur manuscript collector who would never keep a doubtful manuscript. After examining it, Stilley was left in no doubt that it was a genuine document, citing the paper, the writing and the subject 
as all being fairly representative of Burns. For the editor of The Express, this was testimony enough. With the newspaper even suggesting that it would be strange if new Burns letters did not turn up, given that there were only a few hundred known to the world. And while this is certainly true, and even now Burns letters do very occasionally turn up, they certainly do not turn up by the hundreds, uh, complete with scores of previously unpublished poems and songs. Now, Stilly is a, an enigmatic figure uh, who did have a track record of selling genuine manuscripts. Um, in our collections, um, in the Cowie, sorry, not the Cowie collection, the Coulter collection, um, this is a receipt um, which um, Stilly has for the Burns' second commonplace book. Um, and this um, very manuscript is in the Robert Burns Birthplace Museum, um, a genuine uh, manuscript that passed through his hands. However, by the late 1880s, his actions with regard to Smith's forgeries leave a lot to be desired. To defend his credentials for recognising the handwriting of Burns, Stilly wrote to the newly established Burns Chronicle to say the following. In early life, I used to meet a few young literary friends, and at one of our meetings, a Burns letter was offered for sale. It was addressed to Robert Ainsley. Upon perusal, it was found to be so offensive to the memory of Burns that we joined and bought it for four pounds and put it into the fire. Put it into the fire. Um, as John Delancey Ferguson has noted, this is probably the only occasion in history where the destruction of a genuine manuscript is used to support the authenticity of spurious ones. <laughs> now, to pick up on his association with Scott, when Walter Cadell bought some Burns and Scott manuscripts from Stelly, he had them independently verified, only to be informed that they were forgeries. Stelly was indignant. Your note, he wrote, has staggered me a little. I warrant Scott and every document I have is a genuine. Having been an apprentice of a firm in which Sir Walter Scott was a partner, and had his continued friendship of upwards of 50 years and copied many of his manuscripts, I should therefore know his handwriting more than anyone else. 50 years. After performing a quick calculation, Cadell replied that to have had Scott's friendship for 50 years, still he would have had to have been at least 107. <laughs> Certainly, he was an old man at 88, at the time of the dispatch's investigation. So it's possible that his ability to discern manuscripts and to recollect accurately past events was beginning to dim. None of this, of course, helped Cadell, who was not able to recover his money from Stilly, and was <coughs> advised not to take him to court because the cost would just have been too expensive. Now, just as things are beginning to heat up in the Express, they took the decision to stop printing any further correspondence on the matter. Without providing any specific reasons as to why they took this course of action, they simply announced, this correspondence is now closed. Indeed, had it not been for the tenacity of the Edinburgh Evening Dispatch, which picked up the story, Smith may have got away with his forgeries for longer than he did. The dispatch was altogether more pugnacious in its approach to the forgeries, openly remarking that forgeries in Edinburgh were rife. And when asked how it knew this, the paper responded by saying that scores of men in Edinburgh know it. And if Mr Mackenzie does not know it, then he is a simpler gentleman than even we gave him credit for. <laughs> Later, as the whole affair began to unravel, the dispatch waspishly remarked of him that this gentleman's career as a Burns critic, though brilliant while it lasted, has been but brief. Of him it may be said that he went up like a rocket and has come down like a stick. Now the dispatch was on hand to illuminate the issues that had been raised in the Express and to provide an arena in which Mackenzie's manuscripts could be tested. For example, to showcase his collection of Burns manuscripts, Mackenzie gave to the Express another Burns item this time a poetic composition with the title, The Poor Man's Prayer. <coughs> yep, and here's the, the copy as it, as it appeared in the in Raven Dispatch. <coughs> now, bullishly defending the work's authenticity, Mackenzie announced that the original could be seen at his address by anyone who wished to view the handwriting. The response to its publication was immediate. Initially, a raft of critics appeared to denigrate the quality of the work announcing that Burns would never have produced such a piece. Kamarnock Burns Federation would certainly have been praying that documents were genuine, for it became something of a running gag in the paper among those disputing the authenticity to offer sums of money to them should the manuscripts prove genuine. On this occasion, a Mr P. McComish Dot offered a guinea, stating that although he was not an expert in the handwriting, he believed that he'd read enough of Burns to, 
and to label this piece as inept and inconsequent. While this arrangement remained in the, or this argument remained in the realms of the literary critical, nothing could be proved conclusively. However, George Stronach contacted the Edinburgh Evening Dispatch on the 25th of November to prove that the poor man's prayer could not have come from the hand of Burns. Stronach witheringly wrote that, if Burns was the author of the above poem, then not all I can say is that he must have been a poetical prodigy. For in page 482 of the London Magazine for 1766, there appears a poem entitled Extracts from the Poor Man's Prayer Addressed to the Earl of Chatham by Simon Hedge, a labourer. And sure enough, um, unfortunately it's not a very good copy, but um, you can just see that's the start of it there. So that Extracts from the Poor Man's Prayer, um, and that's the 1766 London Magazine. Um, clearly smelling a rat, uh, the dispatch asked their readers with tongue firmly in cheek, was Burns Simon Hodge? Did he pen the lines when he was seven years old? <laughs> now part of the problem for Mackenzie was that his name had already been tainted with the whiff of spurious documents. In May, sorry, <clears throat> yeah, in May 1891, a collection was put up for auction in George Street, Edinburgh, um, mainly made up of Burns manuscripts. And this collection was known as the Rillbank Crescent Manuscripts after the address of Mackenzie in 1891. Like the John Hill letter, Mackenzie again claimed that he had been in possession of the items for 25 years, but had apparently forgot to add the source of his acquisitions. The dispatch was far from concert, uh, convinced by Mackenzie's statements. They argued that in whatever capacity he was operating, FSA Scott, collector, dealer, or whatever else he would like to present himself as, he had now presented to public institutions and submitted for sale numerous manuscripts, of which most had been pronounced spurious. Of particular interest to the dispatch was Mackenzie's claim that he had a parchment copy of the Solemn League and Covenant drawn up in 1643. Were such a thing to be genuine, its value would be inestimable, as there was only one other parchment copy of the Solemn League and Covenant in existence. The best Mackenzie could offer in the way of provenance was to state that he had obtained it from an old lady in Fife. More flimsy explanations were given by Mackenzie to justify, justify, justify how he had come by his collection thanks to an old cabinet which he had purchased from an antique shop. After taking it home, he discovered a secret panel where a large collection of Burns letters were found. This secret drawer must have had something of a TARDIS proportion to accommodate the large numbers of manuscripts that he claimed to have discovered there. One correspondent afterwards requested information on the dimensions of the secret drawer to calculate just how many manuscripts could fit in it. <laughs> Colville Scott suggested that if there had been discoveries made in this manner, then Mackenzie ought to furnish the Society of Antiquaries with a paper on the subject, but this was apparently ridiculed by Mackenzie. The dispatch did some digging into this cabinet story and contacted a dealer who informed, her, informed him, or informed the contact, that such items were meticulously inspected by those in the know when they came into their possession, and as such it would be very unlikely indeed that Mackenzie would find this by himself. Eventually the truth about the mysterious drawer in the mysterious cabinet came out. It was opened by cabinet members in a shop, who informed the investigating journalist that it was merely a stiff and not a secret drawer. They recalled that the only things in it were a few receipts and a gossiping letter from a doctor to a Lanarkshire gentleman relating to an interesting event about to occur in his family. Mackenzie happened to be in the shop at the time and he bought the items in the drawer, but he neither owned the bureau nor asked to become its purchaser. What Mackenzie did do was to get in touch with Dr Joseph Anderson, the secretary to the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, with a view to them purchasing his copy of the Solemn League and Covenant. However, upon examining it, Anderson remarked to Mackenzie that it was written yesterday and advised him to have nothing to do with it. Anderson, it would seem, was more than capable of recognising a fake when he saw one. After inspecting a parchment, which was supposedly a permit granted by Bonnie Prince Charlie to Thomas Shaw, giving him safe passage to Kilmarnock, and was gifted by Mackenzie to the Town Council of Edinburgh, he remarked that if the document were offered to him, he would not have it. Now, the Song League and Covenant certainly excited the readership of the Dispatch. As an example of the type of correspondence that came flooding in after Mackenzie claimed to have a version, it is the following from an anonymous correspondent. Surely when a man comes into possession of such a rarity as a parchment copy of the Solemn League and Covenant, 
It is a matter of interest to the whole literary world to know where it has been lying for the past 200 years. It is bound to have a history, and if Mr James Mackenzie, FSA Scott, is in possession of its history, here is a glorious opportunity to make himself famous. A correspondent signing off as Viator asked, What does the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland think of the present position of one of their number? I challenge Mr Mackenzie to appear formally at a meeting for the purpose of vindicating his action to his fellow members. The honour of the society is at stake, in my humble opinion. Colville Scott was far more direct in his criticism, remarking that it is strange that a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland should give so little aid in a matter of antiquarian interest and public importance when it is perfectly within his power to do so. Now Mackenzie made it known that he also possessed another Scottish icon, this time a manuscript copy of Scots Wahey. Now given the whereabouts of all known copies of this patriotic anthem were well known at the time, a genuine new copy would be an important and a valuable find. Even in the 1890s, it ought to be worth in the region of 100 to 120 pounds. The potential of a new version of Scots Wahey also caused a stir among the readers, although one correspondent signing himself off as merely critic wrote to say that it is really deplorable to think that so many copies of Scots Wahey should be floating about at long prices, and that short-sighted people like Americans and colonials should be taken in by such combined trickery as if every valuable letter was leaving the country. Now, although the dupes of Ferguson's forgeries were by no means located only in North America, across the Atlantic, one American banker by the name of John Kennedy had been spectacularly taken in by the forgeries. It emerged that Kennedy had bought 202 manuscripts from James Stilley, of which 155 were supposedly in the hand of Burns. 21 of the songs in the collection were sent to a Miss Laurie, which in itself would have constituted a major new correspondent. However, mention of her is not to be found in any work of Robert Burns. In order to keep up the pretense of authenticity, most of these letters were endorsed by James Hogg. Uh, the initials JH appear frequently on the letters. This is unusual because of the question which arises is why Hogg would have chosen to endorse and mark so many of the documents. It was suggested that this might be done or might have been done for the 1836 edition of Burns's works, which he was working towards with William Motherwell. But if this was the case, then why did none of the unpublished songs or uh, poems in that collection find their way into Hogg's and Motherwell's edition? Unlike Mackenzie, Kennedy was more than willing to have his manuscripts tested to get to the bottom of things. We can only imagine how he must have felt when experts returned their opinion along with the manuscripts, only to inform that out of 202 manuscripts, 201 were forgeries. <laughs> Indeed, I'd be interested to find out which was the lone genuine item among the collection, or perhaps more than likely the experts took pity on him and threw him a bone. <laughs> now, it was Kennedy who also had the misfortune to purchase Mackenzie's copy of Scots Wahey for £50, which he donated in good faith to the Lennox Library in New York. Um, now, this is a, effectively a copy of a copy um, this is the fake version of Scots Way Hay, which is currently in the Kennedy Collection in New York. Um, now, Antique Smith seems to have had quite a liking um, for this particular manuscript. It's not the only one that he forged. And reminded of that phrase about Richard Nixon, where if two wrongs don't make a right, try a third. Um, so here is a, another version. This version is actually in the Antiquaries papers. Um, another version of Scots Way Hay also faked as well. Um, if we look at the two of them together, um, both of these are fake. You can even see the difference uh, in the writing um, for how Smith is actually, he's, he's done one forgery, he's done another one, they're not even similar. So he's doing these freehand, he's not tracing them. Um, interestingly enough, on the second um, one, you can actually see that he's put a Y for victory and slavery. And then because the original has IE, He's obviously scored that out <laughs> and then added it in. Um, so there we go. Um, and if we compare the one on the right hand side with the genuine article, um, we don't have the original, but we have a facsimile copy um, of the original. So this is the one on the left is a genuine um, Burns uh, in Burns' hand, um, albeit facsimile. The one on the right is the fake. Um, again, if, you can certainly see similarities um, between the two. Um, so it's quite clear that Smith has been able to, to look into view and to see Burns' uh, hand before he's, he's attempted to, to copy the 
copy the version of it. Um, so back to, to Thomas, um, sorry, to John Kennedy in New York. Um, having paid the sum of £750 for his manuscript collection, Kennedy raised an action in the court of session against Stilley to recover the price that he paid for the manuscripts. Stilley denied that he had represented the documents to be genuine, which was suspiciously surprising in this instance because he had vehemently insisted on the authenticity of his manuscripts everywhere else. But he did deny that they were forgeries. Now, Kennedy ultimately yielded to Stilley's repeated appeals based on his advanced years and the state of his health, and perhaps with too great a mercy, authorised his law agents to drop the action. Stelly also bizarrely attempted to deflect the serious issue of forgery by starting a Glasgow versus Edinburgh fight. He says, I have been sadly annoyed with certain self-elected experts and pretenders regarding Burns' manuscripts in the west of Scotland, chiefly in Glasgow, he lamented. One hitherto respectable firm wrote me a particular account of forgeries of Burns in Edinburgh. I immediately challenged them for their authority and required the name, but they giving me no authority, I wrote them that the statement was quite untrue and a malicious scandal on Edinburgh. Now, although Mackenzie and Stilly were knee deep in this mess, clearly they were not the forgers. Other papers who were now aware of this wretched hive of scum and villainy in Edinburgh loudly proclaimed against the audacity of the forger. The Daily Telegraph, te Telegraph bellowed, punishment sufficiently severe for the Scotsman who had forged the letters of poems by Scott and Burns and placed them on the market in order to beguile the inexperienced collector could hardly be either imagined or invented. Hurling him from the top of the Castle Rock in Edinburgh would be far too mild for the offence. <laughs> While perpetual banishment to England would, we fear, be regarded as a blessing in disguise. They went on to add that it will perhaps bring a blush to the cheek of the London Scot to hear that the chief seat of this unpatriotic manufacture is said to be Edinburgh. The forger, of course, was Antique Smith. His first appearance in the pages of the dispatch was under a heading, The Album of the Mysterious Smith. A correspondent looking in a bookshop was induced to buy a collection of manuscripts, some by Burns, some by Thackeray, and so on by the bookseller. Smith was also in the bookshop, claiming to be the owner of the manuscripts, and the album was subsequently sold to the correspondent. More manuscripts were offered. These were historical documents, which were potentially of great value. Smith's cover story was that he had previously worked as a clerk in the office of a Mr. Thomas Ferrier, a writer to the Signet, who was actually a nephew of the writer Susan Ferrier. On one occasion, he asked Smith to destroy a lot of old documents taking up space in the office, which as they were to be destroyed anyway, he thought he might as well make use of them. And it was from these papers in Mr. Ferrier's office that Smith had brought to the bookshop. The fact that Smith had worked for Ferrier was certainly true, he was a junior clerk at the firm, where the papers belonging to the estates of great families would certainly have passed through. What was also part of the backstory was that Smith had been charged in June 1885 at the Sheriff Court with theft from Ferrier's firm, mainly cheques and other documents, but other documents had also gone missing. And on this occasion, the jury actually found Smith not guilty. Now, a recurring theme in the description of Antique Smith was the fact that he appeared affable and mild-mannered trustworthy even, uh, which according to the paper made his crimes all the more remarkable. The dispatch provided the following information about him. A.H. Smith occupies lodgings in Brunswick Street. He is one of the army of casual workers who pick up a job here and there as copying clerks. He appears to be a little over 30 years of age, of sallow complexion with dark moustache and slight side whiskers. The expression of his countenance is unanimated, Rather, he looks dull and appears mildly mannered. He has a plausible, insinuating way with him, although he would be the last person whose appearance would lead one to suspect him guilty of the authorship of such a mass of manuscripts, which have puzzled or deceived thousands of people. But he is not so dull as he looks. He is said to be well educated, and one of his acquirements is currently reported to be an intimate knowledge of the lives and works of Burns, Scott and Thackeray. Among his friends, he is known as Antique Smith, from, the, from frequently having with him old documents or curiosities of various kinds for sale. Indeed, Smith was also known to, have, to deal in everything from yellow teapots to saws to sax horns and guns. Um, he also did some dealing in pictures as well. And the dispatch alludes to the fact that Smith had a talent for watercolours, but leaves the point somewhat hanging. 
So could there be the suggestion that Smith turned his hand to forging paintings as well? Well, who knows, but if he's prepared to forge handwriting, then why not works of art? So let's move on to the methods of the forger. Now, now that the cat was well and truly out of the bag, booksellers started to come forward to indicate that Smith had attempted to sell manuscripts in their shops. One anonymous bookseller wrote to say that Smith had approached him with a Burns letter which he bought for one pound, and a few days later sold him two Scott letters and a signature of Queen Anne. He tried to sell him more, but the bookseller refused, although he still retained his copy of one of the Scott letters, which he now said he was happy to use against Smith should there be a trial. In 1888, Smith frequently visited a second-hand bookshop on George IV Bridge. Among the items that he was particularly interested in was English printed folios uh, and works bound in vellum. Uh, Smith drew attention to himself because he was known to order packages of books, large and small, and then he would carry them off to his home by himself, refusing all efforts to pass them on to an address which they could be sent. In addition to selling forged manuscripts, Smith also put a, a lot of useless books um, back onto the market where the value was greatly increased by the inclusion of autographs of historical figures. Um, a couple of examples will suffice here. Um, this one is, well, supposedly a gift that Robert Burns gave to James Smith uh, from Loch Lee in 1782. Um, and the one on the right-hand side, you know, just a, a random volume of, of 18th century poems uh, picked up by Smith, and then he's added Burns' name to increase the value of it on the other side. Now, from the manuscripts that have survived of Smith's collection, it would seem that there was a progression from the creation of entirely new Burns manuscripts, that is to say, manuscripts which appeared to be unpublished letters or unpublished poems and songs. Although rather than to trust his own muse, Smith merely borrowed from minor 18th century poets, which then changed to the straightforward copying of old Burnsian favourites, such as Scott's Way Hay and To a Louse. Um, so here we have a version of uh, Scotch Drink, um, one of Burns' most, most famous examples there. Um, Burns also turned his hand to um, larger um, numbers as well. This is 12 pages, effectively, of, of the ordination. Um, you can see the binding on it, and there's a copy down there at the front um, of another one, of, of, of uh, another larger um, single poem version as well. Um, this one is the title of the first page of the ordination, but what I've done here is to put it up against um, the, the genuine article. Um, the one on the right hand side is Holy Willie's Prayer. This is from the Glen Riddle manuscript. Um, so again, you can sort of compare and contrast um, the writing styles of, of Smith and Burns. Um, as we'll see later, one of the, the complaints or one of the, the ways that you can detect um, Smith's work is the kind of blue, the slight blue tint on the paper uh, that Smith uses. Um, now, it would have been a far riskier business for Smith to have simply uh, created entirely new letters and songs than it would have been for him to have simply copied uh, versions of Burns' greatest hits. Um, my, my very favourite antique Smith manuscript out of all the ones that I've seen um, is the, this one coming up. Now, this looks like an innocuous um, single page, but it is in fact um, manifesting itself as the title page of uh, poems chiefly in the Scottish dialect. Um, this is an entire copy um, of every poem in the Kilmarnock edition of Burns' poems. Um, so Smith actually had the audacity to try and forge um, the entire Kilmarnock edition of poems. Um, this, co this particular item is not actually in the Antiquaries um, collection. Um, it's in the collection of Bill Zacks, and I'd like to place on record my thanks for Bill for allowing me to, to show this tonight. <laughs> now, Smith's technique was to cut from the volumes of old books that he purchased from blank fly sheets, which would then provide him with paper of the right date. This meant that if there were watermarks, this would corroborate the dates when the letters were supposed to be written. This was especially important when he forged the manuscripts of Burns and Scott. To give the appearance of age of his documents, he dipped them in weak tea. Um, this is a a forged uh, version of Halloween a poem, but you can see this of the ageing and the folds. Um, and this is the, the, the remnants of the tea, effectively, that he would have dipped the, the manuscript in to give it age. Um, what he also did was to rub dirt uh, into the creases of the manuscripts, especially in the case of forged letters, as this would enhance the look of the paper 
in order to make it appear that it had been folded and unfolded many times over the course of a number of years. In order to disseminate his forgery, Smith would use a variety of methods. Sometimes he submitted them personally um, or by letter to li likely purchasers. Sometimes he sold them to inexperienced booksellers or left them for sale with more cautious members of the profession. Sometimes he sent his goods to public auction rooms or when times were bad he simply and simply exceeded demand, he pawned them for what he could get. Um, as he obviously had no intention of returning to claim them, they too eventually found their way into sales rooms. Now, detecting the forgeries. Dr Dixon, the keeper of the records at the Register House, was also consulted about a number of manuscripts. However, rather than contemptuously state that the forgeries were easy to detect and should have fooled nobody, he noted that there were, there were difficulties in pronouncing opinions offhand as there were so many things to be considered and weighed against each other. However, he too had received a large number of manuscripts recently that did appear to be spurious. Letters which had gone up for sale supposedly written by the Duke of Argyll were claimed by William McGilvery, who was the law agent for the current Duke. He wrote to the dispatch to inform them that all of the letters had turned out to be fake when compared with the genuine examples of the Duke's handwriting. On this occasion, the current Duke was advised to destroy the letters so that they could not be accepted as genuine letters in his collection by subsequent generations. In the case of a letter by Walter Scott, which turned out to be spurious, it was the paper used by the forger that gave it away. Writing about the discovery, the anonymous correspondent told the dispatch that, I detected forgery by its paper lately. A document, bearing to be written by Sir Walter Scott in large folio paper, the edges were much frayed and crumpled, and it had been folded up and kept in the pocket till the folds were well worn. But I found that one side of the marks of stitching, showing that it had been torn from the purpose from a book. In all likelihood, it had been the flyleaf of the book. In fact, most of the Scott letters were folded in a different manner from that employed by Sir Walter Scott. The paper may have come from the right period, but it was not of similar paper to which Scott used. And oftentimes the handwriting continually lapsed into that which appeared in the dockets. That is, the accompanying notes describing what the letters were about. At the trial, the handwriting expert, Mr G.S. Ingalls, stated that in his opinion the handwriting of the dockets was undoubtedly that of Smith. Indeed, of 14 Scott letters collected for the trial, six began, I have your letter, and eight ended, I remain. And if Scott did not tend to use these beginnings or endings for his letters, the frequency in this particular batch raised more suspicions about their authenticity. Um, in this example, not Scott, but again Burns, um, you can see that he uses the I remain, um, your very obedient servant Robert Burns. Another thing to note is Smith deliberately keeps things vague. The more information that you add into a letter, the more that you can check against it, the more that you can corroborate in order to find out the authenticity of it. So, Try not to mention um, names if you can. Don't mention specific copies of poems. Quite often he talks about books that he's um, giving back to someone. He never mentions what those books are, so keeps it as vague as possible. Now, a Burns letter dated Ellisland, 19th of January, 1790, and addressed to Mr John Hamilton in air, still had red sealing wax holding a bit of paper on the upper side, as if it were part of the letter which had been torn off in the opening. Unfortunately for the forger, the little bit of paper was considerably larger than the gap on the page from which it had supposedly been torn, and consequently it didn't look like the same paper at all. In one letter, which Burns had dated Mocklin, 30th of April, 1788, this particular line was identical to the handwriting of the endorsement. The Burns manuscripts were likewise written upon paper such as Robert Burns never used. In some cases, the sheets had been plainly torn out of old books. In others, they were artificially tinted to give the appearance of age. All the signatures had been formed on one model, and George Warner, the assistant keeper of manuscripts at the British Museum, argued that the paper was one of the key differences, as the bluish tint that appeared in many of the Burns letters would have been used in legal documents and were not used by Burns in his letters. Dashes, which appear frequently in the genuine letters of Burns and were used liberally in his handwriting, had the appearance of being drawn in more carefully by Smith and in some instances looked as if they'd been underlined. Burns did not tend to sign his memoranda. Not many people would consider doing such a thing. He also tended not to put his name on copies of poems which were sent to his friends unless the poem was incorporated into a letter. Smith always signed such documents. 
partly to increase the value of them. And so sometimes the presence of a signature on such a document is itself suspicious in nature. Um, again, back to the Halloween poem. Um, as you can see, again, it's like Burns has, has added his name at the top of this. Um, and this would, this, would be, this would be unusual. Further errors in the Burns forgeries included any correspondence which was written to George Thompson for his songs intended for his select collection. Burns' forgeries to Thompson are always signed off as from Ellisland. However, Burns had left Ellisland in October 1791, and his correspondence with Thompson did not start until September 1792. One forged letter included the line, I think you will find the enclosed worth the five guineas I require. However, Burns specifically outlined from the start of association with Thompson that he would accept no payment for his songwriting, with one notable exception when he was on his deathbed. In a couple of instances, Smith had used paper that had been worm-eaten, and it was clear that the ink was added later, as Smith worked around the holes. <laughs> if he had gone over them, then he would have blotted the paper. And this gives the highly improbable impression that the larva had been considerate enough to eat around the ink. <laughs> now, in cases where Smith had forged historical documents, inaccuracies in the timeline often provided good evidence of their spurious nature. Sometimes these were glaringly obvious. For example, a Burns letter dated 1797. Or a letter which was written by Claverhouse after the Battle of Killiecrankie, describing the engagement was unlikely to have been produced by him owing to the fact that he was mortally wounded during the battle. <laughs> the historian H.F. Morland Simpson was meticulous in exposing uh, the historical inaccuracies in the letters. Just a, a quick example. A letter signed supposedly by Cromwell at Carron near Stirling on the 19th of October 1650 and directed to the commanding officer at Glasgow ordered him and others in authority to observe the laws against vice, immorality and profaneness. Who were these officers in Glasgow? Well, Cromwell himself had entered Glasgow on the 18th of October 1650 and was still there, so he was the commanding officer. If this was a genuine Cromwell letter, then either that he forgot that he was the commanding <laughs> officer, or for some reason he sent the letter to himself. Now these are just a handful of the errors that are reported in the columns of the dispatch. And Morland Simpson's work in applying the chronological test, as the newspaper labelled it, helped to identify and expose, expose Smith's historical efforts. Although it's easy now to pick the most glaring efforts and to have a laugh at them, the dispatch was keen to remind its readership that despite the errors, it's impossible to deny that viewed as a whole, marvellous imitative calligraphic skill, rare patience and ingenuity, and even proofs of considerable literary knowledge were abundantly displayed. Now let's move on quickly to the trial of Antique Smith. On Monday the 26th of June 1893, Smith was placed at the bar of the High Court of Justiciary charged with selling and pawning spurious manuscripts as genuine. Smith was represented by the advocates, uh, Mr. Dewar and Granger Stewart. There were in fact four charges against Smith. One, that on various occasions between the 1st of January and the 31st of August, 1892, he pretended to Andrew Brown, there he is, Mr. Brown, um, bookseller at 15 Bristol Place, that 53 manuscripts were genuine, and he had had them from the office of Ferrier. Two, that he pretended to George Tate, manager of the Equitable Loan Company, that 32 manuscripts were genuine and that they had been bequeathed to him by his uncle. Three, that he had pretended to James Williamson and Sons pawnbrokers that 10 manuscripts were genuine and secured an advance of six pounds on their security. Four, by doing the same thing to James Mullen, pawnbroker, this time with three manuscripts. 47 witnesses were called for Smith's trial, including James Stilley, who at this point was deemed too old and feeble to attend. 98 forged documents were collected to provide evidence of his activities. Also found at Smith's retreat behind Leith Walk were four volumes of the Autographic Mirror, uh, a useful textbook for students studying forgery, and an extensive collection of ink bottles, pen holders, and other literary requisites. Um, the dispatch provides a, a, a lovely little um, picture. This is uh, Smith's hut where he uh, concocted his manuscripts. Um, they also have a, a picture here. So X marks the spot for the, um, the secret hideout, and X down here is where um, Smith supposedly lives in, on Brunswick Street. Now, when questioned in court, Andrew Brown claimed that he had, been, he had lost out in the transactions, and when it was pointed out that he'd actually made money, 
Uh, he changed his answer to say it was his business that had lost out. Not everyone appears to have been so uh, easily duped. When Francis Buchanan, who brought manuscripts from Brown in 1887 for 50 pounds, was asked how long after that he bought the manuscripts that he believed them to be fake, he answered five minutes. Mackenzie, who was also called, called to give evidence, claimed that the first time he had come across Brown in 1888, he was shown two Burns manuscripts and bought them both. After Mackenzie found out that the Burns items were fake, he consigned most of them to the flames, although he kept around six or seven documents, which were then handed to the procurator fiscal. George Tate announced that the, at the trial that he believed that the documents were offered, uh, the documents offered to him were genuine, um, but that he found Smith himself somewhat spurious. However, his fears were ironically allayed when Smith produced Ferrier's will, which bequeathed the documents to his nephew, whom Smith was pretending to be. It need hardly be added that the will was also forged. <laughs> Smith first appears to have approached the pawnbroker Williamson in Frederick Street, initially offering him a Walter Scott letter. Now, not being an expert in manuscripts, Williamson checked with James Stelly, who pronounced it genuine, pointed out that he should know, of course, because of his association with Scott, and then Smith returned again, this time with a letter from Burns to the Edinburgh philosopher Dougald Stewart. Smith came back for a third time with a Scott letter, which again, Stelly verified. And Smith was given two pounds on each occasion. Needless to say, he did not return to collect them. Nevertheless, when the time did come to sell them, Williamson was able to actually raise the sum of seven pounds and eight shillings. Now for the defense, Smith had his sister Agnes, who stated that in 1884, her brother showed um, her in Mr. Ferry's office a room, the floor of which was covered in documents and papers. Also called to defend Smith was J.H. Doby, gunner with the Royal Artillery, who said that he had lived with Smith for 18 months beginning in 1889, during which time he never saw Smith preparing any spurious documents. And that would be fair enough because he would have gone from his house um, to his hideaway to do such a thing. Now, the defence for Smith took a surprising line when they argued that Andrew Brown knew the items he was selling were fake. They insinuated that a letter which Brown sent to Smith asking for manuscripts across a wide chronological spread was in fact an order like that of a merchant to a manufacturer. But this was explained away by Brown's genuine belief in the extensive haul of Smith's manuscripts. Although this appeared to be madness, yet there was method in it. For if Brown knew they were forgeries, then in that case, Smith could not be guilty because simply possessing fakes or passing fakes on to another person was not actually a crime. Indeed, forgery itself was not a crime. One could produce spurious documents to one's heart's content, provided that they did not attempt to benefit financially or as representing them as authentic manuscripts. This line of defence was then undercut by his own counsel, who went on to contend that they were in fact genuine. Um, obviously, they couldn't have it both ways. Now, it was such a chaotic defence and a mountain of evidence arrayed against him, it was inevitable that the jury found the defendant guilty on all charges. But by a majority, they recommended the prisoner to the leniency of the court, on the grounds of the unusual character of the crime and the suspicious ease that was afforded him in the disposing of spurious documents among the Edinburgh manuscripts trade. For this reason, penal servitude was abstained by the judge and he was instead sent to prison for one year. The dispatch ultimately believed that the natural ability in Smith was perverted and misapplied, and in the manufacture of manuscripts was found an easy mode of satisfying his, quote, loafing bohemian existence. <laughs> um, just as a, a, as a final point here, um, this is a letter that um, Smith sent to um, Andrew Brown, bookseller, um, see here. Uh, he actually refers to the, uh, the lawyer's office and the WS as his ferrier here. Um, I put this up because it seems to be one of the um, few examples, particularly in the antiquaries papers, um, of possibly what Smith's own hand would actually have looked like. Now, after his sentence, Smith faded from public eye and almost nothing is known of him um, as life beyond this point. However, there's one glimpse of Smith uh, over a decade later when he wrote to James Cameron on 20th November 1905 saying, Dear Sir, with reference to our recent conversation on the articles which appeared in the dispatch in the Scotsman newspaper some years ago relating to historical manuscripts, and of which I believe you have formed a collection, allow me to mention that through a lot of balderdash there percolates a sousson of truth. But I really never at any time took the trouble of even reading or studying them after the first or second issues. I left the results to the laws of nature. I did not deem it necessary to answer any of them in public print, but all the facsimiles, so far as I can recollect, 
or my own workmanship, a fact I do not and did not deny. I hope in reading the lubrications you will not hold me in any way responsible for the various wonderful theories propounded by some of the writers. They are simply romance, so far as I was concerned. Yours truly, Alexander Howland Smith. Now, rather than destroy the manuscripts, a number of correspondents had some prescient ideas on what to do with them. A correspondent signing himself off as BS, choice of initials open to interpretation perhaps, suggested that they should be examined by a team of experts who can then mark them as spurious and they should be collected and preserved for reference in one of our public archives. BS then went on to say that because of the scale of the deception, it presented a problem for future generations. These frauds will come out from their isolated hiding places and have then attached to them a history more or less real. Time too will have lent its hand in defacing those features which to us of today are so unmistakable. It will be the ever-present witness in the public archives which will keep alive the suspicion and prove a means of preserving our national relics from this brand of evil genius. Viator, writing in the dispatch, on the very day that Smith was arrested, also urged that the forgeries should not be burned, but instead they should be branded across in indelible scarlet ink, forgery, 1892, and handed over to the advocate's library to be bound up in volumes and placed in the pillory for all time. It's somewhat ironic then, that over a hundred years later, uh, Smith's fo Smith forgeries had infested the manuscripts trade in Edinburgh and infected a fair proportion of the English-speaking world, he has become someone who is collectible in his own right. Tonight, rather than have them in the pillory, we have them on display. As Gerard Carruthers and George Smith have suggested, Smith is even part of the legitimate cultural afterlife of Burns. Smith had the vision to create an illusion on a grand scale and was able to back this up with an ability to create and sustain a market for his manuscripts. Ironically, his life as a copy clerk would actually have set him up well for this as he had to copy long and exacting legal documents and proofreading of the efforts of colleagues was time-consuming, monotonous and repetitive work. It was work best suited to a patient and reliable individual. Smith's case was unique in that the scale of his production provided him not only with extra cash but also the means to make a living as a forger. However, as I hope that I've demonstrated, although Smith was the only one to serve time for his part in the deception, it could not have spread to the extent that it had done had it not been had others not at least been complicit in the affair. I asked earlier how many Smith forgeries are out there. Who knows? A conservative estimate would be in excess of 500 manuscripts. John Delancey Ferguson, who had to contend with the forgeries when working on his 1931 edition of the Letters of Robert Burns, noted that during his time the forgeries had been catalogued for sale at Sotheby's and at the Anderson Galleries, although in both instances they had been detected and withdrawn before their sales. A forced copy of a genuine Burns letter has even been discovered, or had even been discovered, on exhibition in one of the chief museums in Edinburgh. On display at the entrance of the boardroom, we have two genuine manuscripts of Burns uh, and Scott, and we have two forged manuscripts of Burns and Scott. So I'll leave you with a challenge. Can you identify a genuine antique smith? <laughs> Do you want to open it to see if we've got a couple of questions for answers? No. Do you want to see if we've got a couple of questions for answers? Does anybody have a, a question for Ralph? Or are you just going to do the usual, just sit in your hands? There? Yes. Thank you, Graham. Good to see you back. Just pass that microphone along to You showed quite a number of images where the person reviewing them had uh, quite clearly, strong suspicions, and they were rubber stamped, uh, I'm guessing, in an indelible links. Furious. Presumably, this was uh, an official of Society of Antiquities of Scotland. Suppose today, tomorrow, you were going through some manuscripts here, and something appeared to you in the spurious category. What is current curatorial practice in terms of marking it? Well, the, the current practice would be not to mark it at all, um, not to put any kind of stamp um, on it. Obviously, to catalogue it correctly and to make sure that it doesn't um, uh, be falsely catalogued and end up, uh, uh, I don't know, passing itself off as, a, as an original, if you like. But certainly not to stamp it um, with any kind of markings. Uh, it, I mean, I personally think that some of the examples in the antiquities papers are very difficult to tell the difference. 
However, if they are stamped that way, then it's very easy to say, oh, well, this is wrong and that's wrong and that's different and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I'd say I, I'd actually prefer that they, they were catalogued correctly but not marked in any way. I'm interested in the fact that so much went to North America. I wonder if there are institutions which are terribly concerned about people getting access to these to denounce them as forgeries, the Lennox Library presumably has allowed that to happen. Um, for example, J.P. Morgan bought what he thought was the great um, expression of manifest destiny. So what people over here think is a great socialist anthem, a man's a man for all that. I presume they have that thoroughly tested and they're satisfied it's genuine. So are there a great many of these in North America? And just as a writer to that, did Smith distort history in any way? Were biographers of Burns misled by the contents uh, in those cases very often? Well, thanks for it. To say, take the second point first, um, in terms of the, the, the letters, John Delancey Ferguson was, was very meticulous and seemed to have quite a keen eye for picking out a forgery. Uh, for example, in, in his edition of the letters, there's one letter which he has included, which um, appears to be obviously a, a genuine Burns letter, but he himself is not convinced, and he's put down that it's potentially an antique Smith forgery. So even in, in, in an edition of Burns's letters, um, there may have been the odd one or two that's, that's slipped in. Um, one of the things that makes it easier to detect the letters rather than, say, the poems, is the fact that they have to fit into a particular sequence. Um, Burns has to be in a particular point. He has to be writing to a certain group of people. So certain letters from certain periods of time will tend to ref um, refer to particular individuals, um, will tend to be written in a particular way. I mean, Burn Burns's style didn't remain static throughout his entire uh, sort of writing life, if you like. Um, so from that point of view, as I say, you also have to be careful because it could be a you know, Burns might have had a drink, for example, and that might have affected his writing. He might have not been feeling particularly well, um, or he might be ex excited, and that will obviously change the style of writing. So you need, obviously, to be to be very careful about that as well. Um, in terms of um, the letters or the poems and that going to America, uh, the single biggest collection, as I say, is in the New York Public Library, and that's the 202 manuscripts. There's examples of letters um, frequently appearing um, in the pages of the dispatch saying that, you know, a collector in North America, but an anonymous one. So it's like someone that's perhaps found out, was embarrassed by it, now knows it's a fake, has removed it, or at least kept it in their collection. Um, there's examples of them going to Canada as well, and even New Zealand. Um, so as I say, this is sort of spread throughout the English-speaking world, if you like. Um, so they say, there's, it, everyone's effectively caught um, with it. There's the implication that certain sort of landed families in Scotland um, also bought papers uh, to do with Burns, but never came forward, never admitted to say one way or the other whether they had them or not. Um, there's also the suggestion that individuals may have bought you know, the odd manuscript as well, and they might still be holding on to these passed down through the generations. You know, here's an example of a Burns letter, which actually was just as simply a, an antique Smith fake. Um, w from that point of view, I say we just don't know. One of the things I was doing just before I actually came to the library was when I was working in the Centre for Robert Burns Studies, I um, was actually beginning to compile a database um, of the list of all known antique Smith forgeries, and I say got to sort of over 500. But I mean that, and that wasn't even an, an exhaustive search. So, as I say, it's um, yeah, they're out there. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. That was a was a fascinating uh, lecture, and uh, nice to get so many interesting uh, comments at the end of it. Um, one of the phrases that stuck out in my mind actually was um, loafing of a bohemian existence. And um, that's what I've always aspired to actually <laughs> think about it. And it's, it's sad to think that uh, even Smith actually uh, beat me to that. It's also very interesting from the point of view of, a, of an old creator in uh, the Society of Antiquaries to hear um, Joseph Anderson's name mentioned in a slightly different context. We've always held uh, Joseph Anderson in high regard as, a, as an antiquary, as a, an archaeologist, and it's good to see that his, his skills were honed in such a way that they could immediately spot a, 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 a rotten, um, solemn leak um, cabinet. Also, as a curator, I suppose, I, I've always thought that um, it is important uh, to see how people have wanted to commemorate 
the life of some of our, our great heroes, Burns and Mary Queen of Scots. Perhaps it's sad in this case that, um, in, in the case of Antique Smith, it was so many forgeries that we're dealing with uh, of Scott and Burns. Nonetheless, as you say, it is, it is a very important aspect of, of the, the history of, uh, of these great writers, the fact that there was a, a need or a desire uh, for these forgeries. You've, you've given us a very interesting account of, uh, of a very dark, interesting um, subject tonight, for which I'm very grateful. And do remember, folks, before you leave, to have a look at these manuscripts and test your skills on the ones at the front door. Well, let's thank uh, Ralph in the usual way.